How's everyone going today? Is this how it is? Okay. Well, I feel really sorry for you all today. <laughs> Having to put up with me in my current mood is going to be very diff difficult for you. <laughs> uh, I got quite a lot of fairly large sadness coming up the last couple of days. Um, if we can just drop the volume down a little on the left-hand one there. But, um, yeah, so um, my, uh, my feelings over the last few days have been related to a lot of issues that I'm working through between myself and my mother and father. And uh, when I say my mother, my, I mean God. And, uh, um, and um, lots of sadness coming up for me um, about what I do to myself in that relationship. So... Um, so, consequently, I'm in quite a sad place today. So you'll have to put up with me not giving out the type of energy that you're used to <laughs> from, from me. Also, uh, because of that, I have no idea what I'm going to speak of today either. And I was going to put it to you as an audience to uh, make some choices. How does that sound? Does that sound all right? All right. Um, well, one of the things I thought of talking about today um, was about, um, what was it? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right, that's right, about passionately desiring change. So, so I can talk with you about that. Um, I had a lot of things I was going to talk about God with you, but uh, in my current uh, space, that's not a good subject for me to choose um, because uh, I won't be as clear on the subject as I need to be with that subject. So that's going to get delayed. Also, uh, we haven't had a question and answer session for quite some time. Um, so it's open to also doing that. Not that my answers are going to have much clarity today. Uh, <laughs> so that's, a, that's an issue you face. And um, we also have uh, quite a few spirits who are wanting to talk uh, through different people. So that uh, is something we could also do. But how does the first thing sound to you? Yeah. Passionately desiring change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if, if we look at the whole title of, of the talk, um, it's what part of the human soul series of talks that I've been doing with you. And... Passionately passionately desiring positive change is what I'd probably call it. And by the way, we could actually rub out the change and call it growth, couldn't we? If it's positive change, then it's obviously growth. So we could rub, rub, rub that out and call it growth. But the reason why I've called it change is purposeful. And that is that the majority of us are very resistive to change. You, you, we, we, in fact, spend our entire lives trying to make everything beautiful and nice so that it doesn't have to be changeable on a day-to-day -day basis, generally. And so one of the primary things we want to talk about is our attitude to change. Now, just as a bit of background, though, um, one of the things that I'd like to raise with you is about God's qualities and personality. And it is this. God created laws that all cause change. interesting thing, a lot of people, particularly Christian people with Christian backgrounds, say that God is unchangeable and therefore all of God's laws are unchangeable. And I actually agree with those statements that God actually has, when I say unchangeable, God has actually got this huge personality of which I've only ever grasped a small portion and, and as such, obviously has created a lot of laws that are totally unchangeable. You can rely on them, in other words. So man does this constantly. Like, we shoot up a rocket to go to the moon and we're totally reliant on some of the physical laws that God has created that are reliable. 
They are unchangeable. They don't change. You would, would you imagine shooting up a rocket, aiming for the moon, and oh, the moon goes past there a bit faster <laughs> today than it did yesterday, and I just missed my shot, you right? And I'm now off into space or whatever. So you know, of course, those kind of things sound laughable, but that's the fact that God created this unchanging laws causes us to start thinking that God actually then created that we don't change. And that's not the same thing because the laws God created are actually all created to, pro to produce change. So while the law itself is a permanent law, it produces automatically change that, as a part of the law. Now let's have a, give, give an example. The law of attraction. The law of attraction is one of the most... Um, well, as all of other, God's other laws, it is, you can see it on a day-to-day -day basis as one of the most um, permanently... Uh, word, word I'm looking for. Constant, moment-by-moment uh, -moment, um, life-changing event is happening with regard to the law of attraction. So when I, when I say that, what I mean is that at every single moment... Every single thing we do and every single thing that happens to us and every single thing that happens to my body and my life and every single person that talks to me and every single animal that interacts with me and every single bird that interacts with me and every single mosquito that interacts with me and every single thing that's going on at, at that one moment in time is the result of a precise law of attraction at that one moment in time inside of myself. All right? But it changes from moment to moment because the next moment I may have got through one of those emotions or released one of those emotions and now I have a totally different law of attraction on the very next moment which then creates a change in my environment and a change in what's affected. Does that make sense? So while the law of attraction itself is precise, the law itself is also creating changeable circumstances dependent upon what emotions I'm processing at any one point in time or what emotions I'm heavily in denial of at any one point in time. So you could say that the law of attraction is a law that God created that is a permanent law that has a whole set of permanency about it but it creates change within you. It actually is one of the laws that is caused by or created by God to actually create change in you. Now, even all of the physical laws, so there's a law involving genetic reproduction. There's a law involving cellular um, replacement within your own body, for example. Every one of those laws have a permanency about them in the sense that they are consistent and precise in their operation, but they all create change. So did you know, for example, that all of your body is not the same body you had seven years ago. Now you think it is because we're walking around, we look in the mirror and everything looks the same, and so we think it's the same, but actually none of it's the same. Right? There's only a couple of different, I forget what they are now, a couple of different parts of your body that don't change in that period. In fact, there's only a couple of different parts of your body that don't change in a period of three months, let alone seven years. Like, so... so God's laws created this automatic replication system in your body, which means your body is always changing. Does that make sense? Always. So, you know, we say, yeah, it changes and we get the wrinkles and we get... The <laughs> but it only changes in that regard because of the emotions we're holding on to that cause the law to operate in a certain manner with regard to the law of attraction that creates that. Now, if, our, if we were releasing emotions and doing what we do in the spirit world, like releasing emotions and growing in love, then our body can actually grow younger. And this is why spirits arrive in the spirit world in the first sphere, let's say. They look whatever age they were generally when they passed. And then many of them, who, particularly the ones who are older aged, grow young as they progress through the spheres of the spirit world. So how does that happen? Well, it's exactly the same law. The genetic replication of the spirit body cell structure is caused by the soul condition and the, and the law is unchangeable, but it creates change. 
The law itself is not changing, but it creates change because of the growth of the soul. And so all of God's laws create and cause change. So can you see that every time you stop changing, you are immediately in opposition to all of God's laws? Now that's a very big thing to understand. If I decide that I want to have something remain the same or stagnant, or often we say, you hear the words, I am happy with where I'm at. <laughs> as soon as you say those words to yourself, you are now setting up your body and your life and your soul in total opposition to every one of God's laws. Because all of God's laws create change. Now, when we start understanding that at the soul level, we start looking at why we are so resistant to change. The majority of us do not enjoy change, do we? For, what, for whatever reason, we'll talk about some of those reasons. And the, re the primary thing that goes on inside of us when we hear the word change, it's sort of like that other dirty word called responsibility, which perhaps we can talk <laughs> about tomorrow, right? But those dirty words like responsibility, change, and all those kind of words that we actually find quite repulsive at times are because inside of ourselves we have some emotions that cause us to resist change. So if God created laws that, cha that cause change, the laws themselves are stable, but the laws create change, then every time I resist change... I am going to have some kind of law that kicks into effect there that creates a negative part into my law of attraction, doesn't it? That's going to create pain, in other words. Because I'm setting myself up opposite to God's laws. One other thing that's really important to understand about God too is God created a universe oops, that changes. So, so it's not only animate objects that change constantly. It's also all of the inanimate parts of the universe, the part that is not motivated by a spirit body or by a soul. All of those parts of the universe also change constantly. All right? So God created this universe that changes. God then created a whole set of laws that cause change for you so that you can fit into this changing universe All right. so that being the case every time I resist change in my external universe I am again setting myself up to the same opposition that I was describing before I'm setting myself up in opposition to God's laws about this changing universe and the most primary thing we need to remember is God created the human soul to change. So not only here do, are we talking about the human soul changing in terms of its growth of the love that comes from within itself. Now remember I've been calling that the natural love, right? So, so when I've got this human love that comes from out of me to others, I can grow in that love. But I, not only can I grow in the love, I can grow in my knowledge, my intellectual knowledge. I can grow in desire. I can grow all of these different ways. But also, I have the potential to shrink as well. God's laws also created the potential for the human soul to shrink as well as grow depending on your will. So I actually have the potential right at this moment to exercise my free will in a manner that's in disharmony with all of God's laws and that will actually cause my soul to shrink in its capacity rather than grow. And that is a part of the change that can occur. Now, that's the part of change that we're usually afraid of. Can you see that? Like, as my soul shrinks, so it starts attracting more negative 
things from its environment to cause some positive change. But unfortunately, the way we react to it is that it causes us many times to shrink even further and shrink even further. And before we know it, we're now avoiding life completely and we aren't even in contact with our soul anymore a lot of the times because we're not in contact with our real emotions. But the truth is that God created the human soul to change in a manner that is totally dependent upon your will. You're allowed to make your soul shrink. And God created that you're also allowed to have your soul grow. It just depends on your will, what's actually going on inside of yourself as to whether you do that or not. Now, God created the human soul to also, and, and this is the last point I'd like to make with regard to change, God created the human soul to transform and change. Now, when I say transform, what I'm talking about is the transformation between the human soul and the divine. So God actually created inside of each one of us, inside of our souls, the potentiality to become divine like God is divine. Now, I'm not saying that we become gods. What I'm saying is that once we become at one with God, we now are a divine child of God. We are no longer the human soul. And what actually happens from a, a physical perspective is that everything in our body changes as a result. So let's, let me just illustrate that for a moment. Here's our soul in the normal human soul space, right? And here's our spirit body and here's our physical body. Once our soul goes through this transformational process of going through and receiving divine love to the point of at one with God, what happens is the soul changes in its consistency. Right? Some of you have seen me draw the fat soul or whatever. Right? And it changes in its consistency so much and therefore, of course, will affect the bodies that are attached to it. Now, it changes in its consistency so much that the spirit body no longer has the same number of chakras even that it used to have. So you know all this stuff that's on earth at the moment about you having seven, seven primary chakras and they are the crossover of the high density energy points and so forth. Well, when you, where, where you become at one with God and even when you start receiving divine love, the chakras in your body start changing. Some even start merging and others start being created. Right? And so you end up having a changing amount of energy points in your system as a result of the changes that are happening. Because God created your soul not to just stay a human soul, but rather to become a divine soul. That's how God created you. But again, it's dependent upon your will. Right? So it just depends totally on your will as to what happens. So physically, emotionally, spiritually and metaphysically, change is a part of your life whether you like it or not. So what does that say to us, really? It says, basically, that we're going to have to get used to change and eventually come to love change. Yep. So let's look at the process by which we normally go through when it comes to change. Usually we start this process of change um, right at the starting level, which is, I am either stagnant or I'm ambivalent towards change. In other words, I don't really care about change very much at all or I don't want it to happen at all. So let's call that place stagnation. Now, I'm not saying actually that you can remain in that state of stagnation because the truth is that nobody in the universe can ever remain in a state of stagnation. They can think and try to but something will change in their external environment that causes them to finish up changing themselves. So while you may think, oh, well, I'll be able to hold on to this house, this is the best house I've ever had, don't you believe it? Because you know, when you die, you're not going to hold on to that house anymore. right? <laughs> so change is sometimes forced upon you. So you may live in that house for the rest of your life here on earth, but when you pass over in the spirit world, you'll notice you've got another house now. And it may, it may be a hovel or it may be a mansion. It just depends on what soul condition you had and what you developed. So 
stagnation, although it can be chosen in terms of your will power, you can choose it to a degree, it can't actually, you, you are forced by the changing universe to change at some point. Right? You're not going to be able to remain the same for the rest of your existence. Right? So the next step when we hear that, when we hear someone like AJ say that, the next thing we normally go through is anger. Now why do we go through anger about change? Well, because we're quite happy with how things are. Right? Now, when we say happy, probably is not the right term, is it? Because a lot of times we're not all that happy about how it really is, but we think we're happy because we don't want it any worse than this, and it's the best it's ever been, maybe, and so we think, now this is happy. We're not conscious, perhaps, that there's more happiness available to us. And so we go down into this state of, right, I'm... I want this house. This house is my house. I created this house. Are you telling me that I'm going to have to somehow give away this house at some point in the future? And yes, I am <laughs> telling you that. Right? At some point, you're going to have to give it away. And even if that point is when you die, you'll be giving it away then for sure. And it might not even go to the people you want it to, let's face it. So what happens is we normally get into this space of anger when we start looking at change because we've become settled inside of ourselves. We've become quite resistant at this point, right, to change, positive or negative. The main, main reason why we're angry is because we're actually quite afraid, right? And the reason why we're quite afraid is because we think any change is going to be negative. Does that make sense? So because we think any change is going to be negative, we automatically become afraid of change. Now, while that may sound a reasonable thing to do, and while your past life may demonstrate that that's reasonable to you, it's one of the most unreasonable things you could ever think. You see, a lot of times what we do is we're making our decisions on things that have happened in our past when we were children rather than actually looking at what we're capable of doing right now, now that we have more of an expression of our own will. So particularly in the Western world, we have almost complete freedom to do what we want. Now, of course, if you do exactly what you want, you may find certain laws of the country start hammering you in certain ways. So if I decide I'm not going to pay my tax anymore, Right? then sooner or later somebody's going to catch up with you and try to force you into doing it. But the truth is you had your freedom. You're allowed to choose here to not pay tax. And you might get away with it for a while. Right? Because we've got this freedom. Now in other countries it's not necessarily the case. But in reality, for all people on the planet, we have complete freedom. Unless we're afraid. Right? So... As soon as we're afraid, now we start acting in harmony with the fear and now we no longer have freedom. So if I'm afraid of authority, now I'm going to do whatever authority wants me to do even if it's contrary to what God wants me to do. Now no longer do I have fear anymore, uh, f freedom anymore. All I'm doing is living in fear. So because of our fear, we're very resistive to change of any nature, positive or negative. Does that make sense? What's next? Grief. Most of us are very afraid to deal with what the change is going to bring to our life. So, for example, you've been married 20 years. You start working your way through your emotions and you realise that you probably for 15 years you haven't been in love with this person that you've been with for the last 20 years. Right? But you've built a home and you've built a business and you've built a life and you've got children. What do you do? The soul is saying to you, something has to change here. Either I need to fall back in love with this person, <laughs> right? Or I'm going to have to leave it if I'm in leave the relationship if I'm in harmony with my soul. And yet that what does that cause you to have a lot of grief about? Oh now it's like what are the kids going to think about that? How are they going to treat me? What you know, what about where am I going to live? I'm going to live this leave this house that I've had maybe for 20 years, you know, and have to live somewhere else. And what about what happens with my work? Like, how am I going to get an income? What's going to happen there? Can you see straight away all of this grief starts rising about all the things we've created in our past 
that in the end we believed we were, cre we were creating something that was positive, but now we've come to a realisation that actually there's no love here, we're probably going to go through quite a lot of grief. After grief, what happens? We generally get to a point of acceptance. And the problem with the point of acceptance is, is it's not that positive. A lot of times we accept the change and we've accepted that it's happened and we've accepted we have to do this and we've accepted, in the case I just gave, accepted we have to move out, accepted we have to change our life, accepted that I'm going to lose half of my business, my welfare, half of my house is going to be sold and so forth, and accepted all of these things have changed and I've grieved about them, I've actually done the grief work, I've allowed myself to cry and connect with some childhood emotions about all of those things that I've created and how it was all seemingly pointless and all those kind of things. And I go through all of that and I get, after through all of that, I get to this place of acceptance where I accept that this is the truth of my life. But it's still not a positive place. In that place, I'm still not desiring further change. Because the next point is that we need to get to this place where we actually have this desire to change. Now remember... A few weeks ago, I gave a talk about the law of desire. Do you remember that? And how powerful desire was in terms of the creations in your life. Now, if I don't desire to change, if I, I have those emotions, from any of those emotions down about change, but I don't have this, what will happen is that I will, if I only have these emotions, I will always feel unhappy. The only time I'm going to feel happy is when I have my desire to change. That always is going to result in joy. So if you're feeling unhappy about having to change, then it's because there are yet these emotions within yourself that cause a resistance to change. Now, any time I have a resistance to change, remember I also have a resistance to God's laws and therefore... I'm going to have a resulting pain associated which will actually be called, let's call it, unhappiness. That will be the resulting emotional pain. When I have a desire to change in harmony with the laws of God, right, then the only result for that can be joy. That's why, like in the Bible, it says the fruitages of the Spirit are love, and what's the next one? If there are any of you who are Bible oriented, it's joy. Love, joy, peace. And then it went on. Right? So if you look at love, joy, peace, that, you know, joy, peace are all part of the fruitages of receiving God's love and connecting to the Holy Spirit, receiving God's love. They are all part of these things. So joy, if I'm not experiencing joy with change, then it means that I'm actually in one of these emotions about change and that's always going to result in my unhappiness. Always. So, I ask you today how you feel. Everyone's going, today, right? And you can feel it today, can't you, in the audience? Can you feel that, whoa, things are a bit heavy at the moment for us, right? <laughs> going on, right? And that's the reason why is because for the majority of us, we are still in one of these emotions about change. In other words, we don't maybe not want it or we do want it but we're angry about it or, we, or we're afraid of it or we don't want to cry about it or we even are just in a place where we think we've accepted it but it's still not something that's a positive thing from within us. Joy? <laughs> we have the mic. No. <laughs> it's a very interesting week. Thank you. Um, do you think that at some level we need to work through some of our anger, fear and grief and acceptance before we get to desire or we can just jump straight to desire? Um, it's very hard to jump straight to desire. Thank yep. you. Uh, very difficult. And in fact, I'm not recommending that to you at all because, because your anger, your fear and your grief are all going to affect your desire. The reason why we don't have a pure desire for anything generally is because of these other emotions. Now, one thing I would recommend, though, is developing, and this is something I've been recommending for some time to you, if you remember, 
is developing both at the same time. So it's one thing to deal with all of your anger, grief and, and shame and fear and all those other types of emotions, but quite another that even after you've dealt with all of that, all you're going to do is get to this place. That's all you're going to do. And I'm suggesting to you that's not enough to experience joy. To experience joy, what you need to do is not visit your house, but you need to actually... I changed my name. You changed your name, did you? What's it now? No, it is joy. <laughs> but to, to get beyond the place of acceptance of the change into a place of desiring it, actually having a positive feeling of desiring it. So, you see, the, for the majority of us, we're not accepting change because we don't want to accept our emotions revolving the, around the change. Like, how many, of, how many of us have a passion for feeling our fear? <laughs> so, are you passionate about that? Now, I know some of you are, right? I know some of you are very passionate about feeling your fear. Some of you have actually created a life where every single fear, or most of them, gets triggered at moment by moment. That's great. That's a very powerful place. If we can go across to Jen. And Hi, AJ. Where does faith fit into our equation here and the divine truth, you know, like the understanding that comes from God outside ourselves um, in regards I'll, to I'll talk about faith as a separate issue because it is a very important part of this whole process, yeah, of desiring positive change. Yeah. But, it, but it's, faith down the track is going to be a whole separate discussion. I'm going to talk about faith for a whole day. But for the moment, I'll discuss some issues of faith with regard to positive change. Yeah. But it'll be a bit after this part. Peter? Uh, I, I was wondering how all this applied to the um, predictions of earth changes and how we can get excited about the earth changes that are coming, <laughs> uh, are supposed to be coming, um, and whether the only way to get excited about the changes is to go through the anger and the fear and the grief. And, and, and then... Um, um, I'm curious as to what one would look forward to. We can do two things at the same time with this. So, so this is what I was saying. Can you just switch that mic off for me because it's interfering a little. Um, we can do two things at the same time with this. We can actually deal with the emotions of fear, grief, anger and so forth. We can deal with those emotions. And we can also look at the positive parts of all of things of change as well and start allowing that to enter us. You see... What's happening for many of us, and it's something that I've discussed recently with a small, I think there was a couple of people at our house and, uh, and we had this discussion where the group of people there were all in a place of fear about a certain subject. And, uh, and I said to them that the fear isn't real. Right? So the truth is that this emotion is not real really from God's perspective. This emotion is not real either. Because these are capping emotions, right? The ones above there. So they're not really real. We create them to get away from something else. right? So for, for example, let me just imagine, imagine just for a moment that you'd been abused as a child, sexually abused as a child. right? Now, as an adult, you now need to deal with some of the emotions about that abuse, right? If you want to progress and grow. But many of us get into this really stuck place where we don't want to deal with the emotions because we think that it means going back and actually experiencing everything that we experienced as a child again, like reliving it. And we often hear the term... We don't want to reinfect ourselves with the same problem. You hear that quite a lot, right? Where you don't want to reinfect yourself. The truth is quite different. It is actually impossible for you to relive a past event. <coughs> I'm going to say it again. The truth is that it's actually impossible for you to relive a past event completely. I'll give you an example. Here I am as the child, right? Now, one of our microphones is playing up with the battery, I think. And I wonder if it's mine. There, go off. If you can, it's off. Yep. Let's just see how mine goes and we'll see. Um, so here I am as a child 
And here I am growing up. I get obviously bigger and I'm growing up into an adult. And here I am as the adult, right? Now, I've changed over that period of time, have I not? I've had a whole group of experiences which has caused growth, not only growth in my body itself, but also growth in my spirit body and growth in my soul, right? Changes have occurred. Now, some of the changes like in our soul can be negative, but there are still changes that have occurred. So the truth is that if I've got a locked up emotion at the age of five, so if you can think of any emotion that you have not yet experienced from your childhood as a frozen emotion at that age, right? So if I have a locked up emotion at the age of five, the truth is even as an adult, if I re-experience that five-year-old emotion, I'm still not going to be in exactly the same situation because the reality is that I am an adult. <laughs> I am a very, very different person going through this emotional experience. So while it may feel like I'm going to have to relive the five-year-old event, the truth is you can never relive the five-year-old event without being five years old again in the same event, right? But what we do is what happens is there's a lot of setup that goes in inside of us of fear. We go, oh, I'm going to have to relive it again, I'm going to have to relive it again. And we get into this zone where we believe, we believe that this past, this past experience, this five-year-old experience that's locked up inside of me, becomes so big within our mind, we make it bigger than it actually really is in a lot of ways. And I'm not saying that abuse isn't a bad thing. Sorry that abuse is a good thing. I'm saying abuse is a bad thing, right? And I'm not saying that it's not a terrifying event because abuse is a terrifying event. But what I'm saying is the adult is now much more capable of coping with the emotion of that event than the child was. Does that make sense to you? But we don't believe that the adult is. That's our problem and that's where the fear is. That's where the fear isn't real. Remember, fear is the false expectation appearing real to us, right? And so what happens when I'm in a state of fear is I cannot desire generally. You'd be surprised. You, just have, you, you, you get together with a person like of the opposite gender when you're you know, in that love stage, you know, where you, uh, when I feel you can be in the love stage all the time, but in the initial phase of meeting the person, you know, have all these things going on, and a lot of the times what happens is we act without fear in those moments, don't we? Have you noticed that? Like you don't care whether your family think he's an idiot, right? <laughs> do you? you just go ahead anyway, right? And you don't care whether your friends think you're sleeping around with the wrong person. You just go ahead anyway, right? Because there's this passionate desire in you. But what happens over a period of time, and usually it's a short period of time, is a lot of those other fears start kicking in into rea what we think of as reality. It's not real. We were totally capable of remaining in that passionate, desiring place without all the fear. But what happens is that when we get into a situation that is real, automatically anything that's not real inside of us gets triggered. It automatically gets confronted. And so, the beauty of actually starting to live in your desire about certain things is that it will automatically confront the list of emotions that prevent us from not desiring change. So getting back to your question, Peter, where you asked about like world change events. Now, how do most of us feel about world change events? <laughs> well, some say, say, some say bring it on, okay. So. <laughs> Not very truthful, by the way, but anyway. <laughs> that was going to be my question. <laughs> well, just hang on a sec. What, what else do we normally feel about world change events? What are the different emotions? And you can ask your question. Uh, afraid? Afraid of what, though? Let's, so your trouble with fear is we can say, I'm afraid, and then we get away with it because basically we're not saying what we're afraid of. Oh, okay. right? So let's say what we're afraid of. What are we afraid of? Loss. Fear of losing. Losing, 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 losing family. Family, friends, possessions, life, comfort. Fear of 
<laughs> fear of surviving it, yeah, okay. <laughs> fear of what it's going to be like afterwards. Fear of what it's like afterwards. All right, so with regard to being injured, there's a fear of personal safety, isn't there? All right, so can you see we've got, we can have lots of different fears, can't we, associated with that particular thing. Now, of course, a lot of those particular fears are going to define my actions from now on. So you know what I'll start doing? I'll say, all right, I'm afraid of losing my family, so what I'm going to do is I'll create a nice little niche where all of my family can come with me and live. All right. I've just broken a number of God's laws, by the way, but I don't consider that, do I? I think that's being loving. You know, I'm creating something for my family and they can all come and live with me and isn't this going to be wonderful? So that gets rid of that fear. I'm now not afraid of losing my family. No, it doesn't get rid of the fear. The reason why is your family could still pass. They could be in the wrong place at the wrong time and pass. Does that make sense? So it doesn't actually get rid of the fear. All we're doing when we're acting upon these things is we're trying to circumvent our fear. We're actually trying to run away from our fear. We need to process the fear. How do you process the fear of losing your family? Act in harmony with your desires at all times. Guaranteed half of your family are going to leave you. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Have you tried that? Right? Sometimes more, right? sometimes all of them, right? Why? Why does that happen? Because many times our family does not have an open spirit enough to allow us to change without them being, you know, somehow feeling negative about it. And so what they do is they then reject us. Well, now we've lost our family. Now we can go through the emotion. <laughs> the law of attraction has brought us an event, go through the emotion. And you know what? Half of your family or even more may finish up returning to you after you go through that emotion and release that from you, right? So when we're afraid of losing our family, the way to deal with it isn't go and build a house for our family to be where we are. The way to deal with it is actually to live in your desires and allow it to be triggered. So what are my desires with my family? What are my desires with my friends? What are my desires about my possessions? And many of us are very afraid about not having comfort, right? Wouldn't that be the case? So how many of us would feel like, yeah, totally comfortable living in a tent? Oh, by the way, the, the mattress, I forgot to bring that. So there's, <laughs> so there's like sand on the ground that you rig yourself into at night. like. And uh, go to sleep and, oh, I forgot the, the blanket. No electric blanket either. Oh, no electricity, so that's gone. And if it's cold, what do I got to do? And, and, and I've got all of these discomforts coming up. Now, what's the best way to deal with the discomforts? Well, what we do do is we go around and we, get, we buy that thing and that makes us more comfortable there and we buy that thing and that makes us more comfortable there and we get that thing. We get that caravan that we wanted just so in case we could take that with us and we get the, That's what we do, don't we? In other words, we're not dealing with our discomfort. What we're doing is we're, uh, we are living in our discomfort. Right? We, are, we are using our discomfort to create our life. Now, if we really wanted to deal with our discomfort, what we would do is we'd go, right, okay, I know I've got some issues with regard to living out of, you know, in, in comfort. So what I'll do is I'll buy a tent and I'll buy something just to sleep on, nothing to cook with, and I'll go out maybe to the sanctuary out there and I'll live there for a month like that and see how I go. No fridge, no freezer, no washing machine, no iron, no... And some, some of those things sound like good things to get rid of, right? And, and just see how it goes. How does it feel? And let yourself deal with the feelings that come up that cause you to feel uncomfortable and as you do that what will happen is you'll deal with some of the fears so you'll get from the fears into the grief and it, and you'll feel some grief about like being a firstly you'll feel wow is this what it's going to be like after there's nothing like after the world change events have occurred is this what we're going to be like will i even have a tent you don't know do you you might be running out the backyard have, have who's seen 2012 yet yeah. okay there's a, there's a lot of pretty unusual things going on in there, but, but how they were driving down the road and the road behind them is just like, 
had, had, remember how they come out of the house? Sorry, I don't want to spoil it for those that haven't. As they come out of the house, the house just sort of falls into the ground. Like it's like, like yeah, you're gonna you're gonna be able to go. Yeah, I forgot my makeup. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> and run back. It's not like that at all, is it? So you're going to have to, you know, sometimes you might have to make decisions for your life and lose a lot of other things in the process, right? Isn't that the case? Now, if I have a lot of discomfort, emotions in me of wanting comfort and I've had a life of comfort and I want that comfort and I haven't been willing to deal with those emotions, wow, how many emotions am I going to have come up when I lose my possessions? I might be crying for days and you've seen this on telly, have you not? Like when a person's had a fire gut their house and they've been so distraught, so distraught, it's been a major life-changing event for them because of their distress about losing their possessions. They've still got their life and they've even, many of them have got an insurance policy to pay out and buy back things, but their own, their connection with the possessions just gets triggered. Does that make sense? So fear of losing comfort can be dealt with pre any of these events. Now, for the majority of us, still in answering Tita's question, the majority of us, are living in this place where we're acting upon our hidden fears rather than actually dealing with them. So, so when, I, when I think, all right, all right, there's going to be some world change events, what I need to do is I need to go out, build a house, somewhere that I think is going to be safe, do all this, do all that, do all this, do all that, do all this, do all that. Do all this. You know, I'm not changing my law of attraction. I'm not changing my soul condition. How, what guarantee do I have that I'm even going to make it out to that place? without doing some changes in my soul condition and my law of attraction. I'm not going to have any guarantees. And so what we often finish up doing is in this space, we are living in the fear of it rather than actually dealing with the fears themselves, like releasing them from ourselves. And when we live in the fear of it, what we're going to do is be attracting the events that we're yet to heal within ourselves because of the law of attraction. We're going to be attracting the events. And so while I think I'm changing, in reality, I'm still living in the fear, so I am not changing, and I don't really even desire change here where it really matters. And so what will happen is everything will eventually be confronted because God's laws don't change. My fear is going to get triggered at some point. Now, it's far better for you to, to allow that to start happening now than it is waiting for some event to trigger it for you. Does that make sense? When you do it now, you've got a lot of, you know, there's a lot you can do positively to trigger these fears. Now, when it comes to receiving inspiration from our spirit friends about it, I'm saying to myself, I'm not in fear, I'm not in fear, you know, I'm fine, you know, I've got everything sorted, I've got my house out there and I've got my water tank and I've got my this and my that and my this and that. All the things which were, by the way, created to avoid my fear. Right, so I've got all that happening. on, And then I'm saying, now I want some spirit direction about what else I should do. Now, what are the spirits going to give you as a direction if they're on the divine love path? Your they're going to say, firstly, follow your desires. But at the moment, you're not following your desires. You're following your fears. You're actually living in this place of creating an, an environment based around your fear and not your desire. What's going to be the result of that? Well, the results are never going to be too positive, are they, when you think about it? I'm creating a whole life that's still out of harmony with all of God's laws because I'm willing to stagnate in my fear rather than change. And I'm actually building my environment to suit me not changing rather than me changing to suit a new environment. Does that make sense? Like... So if I'm building an environment to support me not changing, do you think that environment's going to stick around? Of course not. It's not harmonious with God's laws in the end. All of God's laws finish up creating change. Right? So what's the point in me going and creating something way, way away, you know, where I think everything's going to be, but driven by this fear that I don't release? There is no point at all to it. None at all. I may as well have stayed home and just dealt with my emotions. That would have been far more powerful than going and doing that. Now, for many of us, when it comes to earth change events, we can't even receive guidance about the issue because we're still in a state where we're really living in our fears about the issue. And the case in point is 
if I'm living in my fears, I actually will act upon and create the same things I have now to avoid them. So I want, I'm, I'm afraid of discomfort, so what I do is I go and create another thing that gives me comfort. Have I dealt with any fear? No. Will that emotion be dealt with in the future through some law of attraction events? Yes. Right. So I could create this beautiful house and a little shake comes along like, you know, like an 8.9 <laughs> earthquake or something <laughs> and all of a sudden it's all down around my ears, right? And, and I, I don't know what might happen. I could build the house and be afraid of people attacking me which it creates a whole group of people coming along as vigilantes and just stealing my house from me. Couldn't I? That's happened, hasn't it? How many times has that happened in the world in the past, do you think? So many times. See, if I am afraid, if I want my possessions so badly that I'm willing to, like I, I feel devastated if I don't have them, I'd even perhaps be willing to fight those people to retain these possessions that I've built for my own comfort. That's how strongly our emotions can be acted upon at times. And I'm still resisting change because I'm living in the spate of fear but I'm telling myself that I'm not afraid. Right? And this is the problem with, with change is we can tell ourselves that actually we're changing and we're doing things but we can actually stay in an emotion that is keeping us stagnant. So what I'd recommend for you to do is like, sure, like the bring it on emotion. You know, a lot of times that emotion is also driven by fear. What fear would that emotion be driven by, do you think? There's some anger behind it, perhaps, right? So bring it on. Yeah, I'm sick of this well being like it is. You know, I have to do this. I'm sick of the rules. I'm sick of the laws, you know, that we have that are just pointless. And I could go on and on for another half an hour about all the things I'm sick about. about. So bring it on, you know, bring it on. I, myself and Mary went to uh, a movie, The Knowing. Have you seen that movie? Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, it's a pretty intense ending. Anyway, Mary comes out of the, out of the movie with that feeling. Like, just bring it on. I'm sick of the world being like it is. Just bring it on. <laughs> and we had to just work through, like, what's that about? You know, what's going on there with regard to that emotion? Because that's an emotion that is quite angry, isn't it? And therefore covering fear and therefore covering... And so, so, and therefore covering grief, of course, to finish that off. And, and so we need to deal with those emotions if we really want to change, right? Fear of what it's like afterwards. Many of us are very afraid of what it's like afterwards. Not so much about what it's physically like afterwards, right? But when it comes to earth changes, things that we think are going to happen, we're often afraid of what it's going to be like emotionally and with experiences, for example, many of you ladies are afraid if there's no laws, what's going to stop a man from raping you if he wants to? <laughs> Sorry, I just added to your fear list. That I, right. <laughs> Does that make sense? Well, that, that is a valid, like, it feels like a valid fear, doesn't it? Like, as a woman, I might not have quite as strong a body as many of the men, uh, and, and so therefore I might not be able to fight them off, is the way I'm thinking, and then I don't want to have to fight them off either because that's not harmony with love and what do I do there and you know there's all this confusion that comes up. What is it going to be like after? What, are, what is it going to be like if there's all these vigilantes going around? Like, or people going around just taking things that they don't have? Like savages, like savages yeah. So let's say, let's, say, let's say they come up to your house and they say, oh, you've got, AJ, you've got 11 water tanks. <laughs> We're going to take all of them because we could use them. Well, that's possible, isn't it? And if I haven't dealt with my emotions about that, what am I going to feel? Well, what am I going to drink? In three days, I could be dead. I'm going to have a lot of emotions about that, right? And to, to work my way through, right? So can you see it's better to work your way through those emotions now like, rather than waiting to those things? But fear of what it's like afterward also prevents you from receiving guidance this is spiritual guidance now from your guides about how, what you need to do emotionally to deal with what it's like afterwards. Because if I'm so afraid about dealing with an emotion, do I want to deal with the emotion? No. What I want to do is avoid the emotion. So what will I do? I'll try to avoid the emotion 
and then when the events happen, what am I going to do? I've got this emotion still in me of afraid of people and what they might do to me. Do you think some things are going to happen to me? Yes, of course, because that will be my law of attraction. Alex, if we can go. Um, I'm finding too that spirits want to give you that information to stop you from feeling the fear. Spot on. Because I went around the sanctuary one day actually looking at like what I could do. Yeah. And um, they just told me, oh, no worries, build teepees. All you need is a saw and some, um, some tarp. That's all you're going to need. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, knowing stuff, and they've told me a whole heap of other stuff. Yeah. But knowing that kind of, and I've done a little bit of fear around all that. Yeah. But um, I feel like, and even when I've done fears around spirits and, and all that sort of stuff, they say, or, or fears of moving up here and living all the comforts of, of you know, city life. Yeah. They said to me, don't worry about that. You know, we'll take care of you. You don't, you don't need to go into the fear. Yeah. 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 And that indicates that a spirit's not on the divine love path, obviously, mm. hey, because they'd be encouraging you to go into your fears. So, so not to live in them, of course, but to go into them and experience them and release them. That's what they want to encourage you to do. So a lot of times what we're trying to do, and what at, because of we not wanting to feel our fear, we're going to attract a group of spirits around us who also don't want us to feel our fear, and they'll tell us that everything's fine, you don't need to worry, and all those other things, which, by the way, in the long run might be very true if you dealt with your fear. But if you don't deal with your fear, yes, you're going to need to worry because at the end of the day, your fear is going to attract a whole sequence of events. And we need to release the fear once we release the fear, ironically then, not only do we not need to worry, but we don't worry anymore because we've released all the real fears that are driving everything. Done. AJ, the bring it on was, um, is um, an intellectual thing. Mm -hmm. So my question to you on that was, um, and, and mine doesn't come from X, don't believe, Mm -hmm. But it was an in, it's an intellectual thing. I, I keep on saying, well, bring it on because, you know, we, we, we need some earth changes and um, for divine love and all of those type of things. But I'm saying that intellectually. So the only way for my soul to recognise that is that to go through all of the, the emotions attached with it. Mm. Because I, it's, I am saying it intellectually. My soul's not saying it. And That's I know right. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the case in point is like... Where do you want to live still? Where do you, you know, how do you want to live still? And all those kind of things. If you, if you still want to live in lots of comfort and luxury and, and all those kind of things, then obviously your soul's not saying the same thing as your head's saying. Yeah. Um, so you need to look at that. So the only way is to um, um, feel the, the emotions. emotions. Yeah. Can you just flick that off? Uh, and what we were up to, sorry, Ange, we were up to your question. What was that again? You just answered it about the, uh, that's right, the the uh, movies that you could watch. Um, there's quite a lot of them. There's a new one just being released called The Road. A uh, very dark movie. The Road. A uh, very dark movie about obliteration in the States and a man and his son trying to go to a place where they're going to be okay and he only has two... He's got a pistol, he's got a gun, as do most people in, the, in America. Um, and he has two bullets in his gun. And, uh, and it describes a series of events. Um, uh, Mike? I Am Legend is a good one. I don't know whether you've seen it. No. Um, it has Will Smith in it. Yeah. Um, and basically he's the only man pretty much left. Oh, yes, yes, and that's right. And everyone else has gone mental, sort of. Yeah. Um, and they have to stay in the dark, like the scary people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I recommend it to everyone. It's, it is a bit scary, but it, yeah. um, it would be good for people who are scared of being alone by themselves and, you know, the way people will act like real savage and like, want, like bloodthirsty and mm. would do anything to, mm -hmm. you know, save themselves. Yeah, yeah, I am legend. Um, you want to go up to Angela uh, be up behind there? Yeah, you, no, no, you, oh, you didn't have your hand up. Oh, you're just flicking your hair. <laughs> joy, joy down the front there. Thank you. Um, thanks, Alex. I just realised one of my. Oh, he's gone. 
just realised one of my addictions is, um, in fact, I've been called the certainty queen. The cer- but one, of my, <laughs> one of my addictions is giving other people certainty. certainty. And I've just realised how that takes them away from facing their fears. Yeah. It's like when somebody comes up to you and says, I'm mm. really afraid of that. Oh, you don't need don't to be afraid of that. It's actually, you know, and away we go and we tell the story, but we've just got the person out of dealing with their stuff. Yep. Our spirit friends who are on the divine love path, by the way, don't do that. But the spirits who are on the natural love path do that all the time. Right? So that was also an indication of which kind of spirits are with us if we're always trying to turn things into the positive all the time when they're quite negative and we need to feel them. So, so getting back to the point though, obviously if, I, if I'm in a state of fear... Fear is a state that doesn't desire change. It desires to be satisfied differently. And when I say desires to be satisfied, satisfied differently, I mean when you are in a state of fear, you will desire to fix whatever you're afraid of very rapidly, but without dealing or experiencing with the fear. Does that make sense? So you'll be in a state where you want to actually... Uh, get rid of the fear that's inside of you, but instead of actually releasing it by experiencing it, you'll feel drawn into doing something that negates it instead. Does that make sense? And that's a very strong thing that we as a human race are tempted to do with regard to fear. We always want to finish up doing something that negates it rather than actually experiencing it ourselves. Right? So, the subject, of course, is passionately desiring positive change. So, how can I passionately desire something if I have any of those things going on? Obviously, it's going to be very difficult. Now, many of us, the truth is for many of us, though, is that we have many positive desires that are harmonious with love, but many of those desires have fears attached to them which cause us to not act upon them in the manner that we normally would. Now, to give you an example of that, many of us are passionately desiring to become more childlike, right? Where you want to be in the moment, in the now, doing the things you like to do, all of those kind of things happening, being creative in in your childlike expression. However, so let's say the issue is I want to be childlike. What happens with my fear? So that's my desire, and that is a pure desire, is it not? So that's a pure desire, but now how does my fear distort my desire? What happens? What kicks into effect with my fear? Well, I'm afraid of other people judging me. So I'm afraid of judgment. And judgment, by the way, is a terrible, terrible emotion. If you could see it as a colour in the spirit world... What it looks like is it comes out of the person as this sort of blackish, brownish goo. Right? And any person who's accepting the judgment, it enters. That's, it actually physically enters you. So, so, you know, when you judge somebody, this stuff comes out of you, right? And when, when, it, when it comes out of you, it searches for a person, and usually we're judging a person specifically, right? or a group of people, but most of the time specific one person. So what we're doing is we're judging them and as it comes out and it goes straight to them. Like a, if you could think of it like a great big gooey black, blacky brown cloud, right? <laughs> that that person has the choice to breathe in or not. But if that person has any feelings of unworthiness inside of them, they will breathe it in. It will enter them emotionally. That's what is actually happening every time you judge somebody, right? The receiving end of that, how does that feel as a child if you're open? It's like, like, it just feels terrible. You know what it's like being judged? Somebody comes along and judges you. This is why it feels so bad. It actually is an interaction that occurs specifically between two people. What other emotions besides judgment? I might be afraid, a similar emotion of judgment is afraid of people's condescension. Condescension. Um, Condescension is an interesting emotion 
because what we can do is we can treat somebody condescendingly quite easily. And it doesn't necessarily sound like a judgment at the time we do it. Right? But, it but it feels quite vicious when it actually enters a person if you're open. So when you are emotionally open to, to all emotions coming towards you, as a child would be, you will feel the feeling of condescension as a very, very dark emotion entering you. And it's exactly the same in the spirit world. It has a colour and it has, has a feeling associated with it. And um, someone recently, I think it was Natalie, wasn't it, sent us a channeling she did where a spirit described to her the emotions that were coming out of her and how they entered those spirits. And when she had the emotion of judgment coming out of her, it, the spirits described them all, themselves all getting down and many of them, because they, because they didn't want to feel that terrible, unworthy emotion, instead projected rage back at her. Right? So you end up with this dynamic going on from a spirit perspective, right? where here you are, here's the spirit surrounding you, right? and what happens is that you're projecting a judgment or a condescending type of motion inside of yourself, which actually, because of their own lack of dealing with the emotions of the result of it, actually allow, it, they can't prevent that emotion from entering. So when you judge them, they feel judged as a result. So the feeling of judgment happens inside of them and then what do they feel? Oh, that's unjust. So they get angry. And what do they do? They project anger in return. And if you are unable to actually stop anger from entering you, what happens is that rage and anger, it will enter you. If you're afraid of rage and anger, that, that rage and anger will enter you. And you'll feel the rage and anger just inside. You become very afraid or in that instant. Does that make sense? Now these are actual, these are not only just emotions, by the way. There are metaphysical things going on at the same time these emotional transactions are occurring. And if you could see them, you'd be like, whoa. Like, I'd never want to do that again if you could see them. The problem is on earth we, is we don't see them, right? And because many of us are desensitised emotionally, we don't feel a lot of them going on. But we go, oh, that was a bit strange, but oh, who cares sort of thing. But we don't realise there was just quite a lot of soul damage happening, right? So judgment, condescension prevents you from, keeps you in the fear. And now the desire, so getting back to the desire, which was the desire to be childlike, Right? Now what's happening? I desire to be childlike, but I'm afraid of all of you judging my, childish, my childlike behaviour. So I'm going to not act as childlike anymore, am I? And I'm not saying childlike is childish, by the way. Right? So, so I won't act childlike anymore. So when I feel a passion, so let's say I feel a passion to dance all of a sudden, right? And I start skipping around and dancing, and then everyone's looking at me. <laughs> what's that idiot doing, right? What's, what's happening straight away? That goo is entering me, right? Straight away, feeling that emotionally, feeling that entering me. And what am I going to do? I just stop in my tracks when I just go, oh, okay. You know, like, I can't do that here, right? Because, and so now my desire has been severely limited by my own fear of the judgment. You see, while I have the fear of the judgment, the judgment enters me. Fear of the condescension, the condescension enters me. While I have the fear of anything, that enters me, by the way. So, so if I'm afraid of sexual projections, guess what I'm going to get? Sexual projections. And those sexual projections will enter me. They will enter me and I'll go, oh, you know, and panic about it. And then if, I, if I'm given to a bit of anger in return, I might get angry back at the person. How do you do that, you know? Or I might, if I, if I feel afraid of them, I might go and pander to them. Oh, you know, and start treating them differently because of the sexual projection in order to control them or whatever. But, it, but either way, I'm now out of my desire. Can you see that? So when I'm out of my desire, I'm out of passionately desiring change for me and I'm now back into this mix of emotions that causes me to not passionately desire change, positive change. So... <laughs> The key, the key thing with all of it is if I am willing to 
experience each one of these emotions that my fear is there and present about, then of course I can stay in a childlike place even though I'm also afraid of it. Right? So this is how you can stay in a child. So how many of you are afraid of singing in front of a group? Well, very shortly, you're going to have an opportunity to address that. <laughs> because what myself and Mary decide is the next get-together we have will be a karaoke. Yeah. Right? So we'll have bits of dancing, just to get you warmed up, and then we'll go into karaoke, where you've got to do some singing. Now, all of those people who want to come, obviously we would like you to participate. And that will help you get through some of that fear of singing right in front of others. Does that make sense? And let yourself feel your emotion as it's happening. Right? These are all practical things you can do. But you can see that I might have a childlike desire to just sing, but I'm afraid of judgment, condescension, oh, I've got a bad voice and all those other things. And what happens is I shut down this desire to sing. So no longer is my, am I in the desire to change place, I'm in the fear of changing place. And you can see how it's obviously very important to work your way through the things that keep you in the stagnated place if you want to grow, emotionally grow. So how many of you desire, are afraid of public speaking? Public speaking? Not quite as many as public singing. <laughs> okay, well that, that, you have many opportunities to address this. You know, there are, there are places you can go to where you have to give a five-minute talk in front of a group of people, where and they, you know, they go through a heap of things to teach you. My 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 suggestion is throw out all the things they teach you, and just get up for five minutes and talk about what you are passionate about, without notes, and without any notes, without any preparation. Now, the first time you try to do that, you go. Bleh. I've got to sit down. <laughs> right? but usually the first time you do that, you'll be so caught up with fear that, you, that nothing will even come out. Right? And then it's a matter of working your way through it. Now, you know what we do instead? We go, all right, I've got to give a five-minute talk. What am I going to give a five-minute talk about? Let's write down the subject. Then I'll do all this investigation, 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 write down a heap of notes, 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 notes. Now I've got like a 50-minute talk instead of a five-minute talk. Now I've got to condense all of that into what I want to say, so I scrub all that out. And I've spent now three hours preparing my five-minute talk. <laughs> right? And even then, I'm not happy. You know, like, oh, I don't know if this is going to go. And then I get up there, and instead of being connected with the audience, what's happening? I'm so worried that I can't connect with anybody, even myself. Right? <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm reading from my note cards, one after the other, you know? And... That's the issue that we face, is that our fear stops us then from acting in our desire. It would be lovely, wouldn't it, to get up in front of 100 people at some time in the future and describe your own personal experiences with your own growth on the divine love path at some point. Wouldn't it be, be great to be able to do that and help people through all that? How are you going to do that if you don't get over that fear? It's going to be very hard, isn't it? Like you'll be making notes here and notes there and before you know it, like... Nothing's going to come out right every time you say it. And that's, uh, and that's what's going to happen. So, so the key with all fears is that we can easily address them by taking action. Right? And I've described to you many times in my past where I've had to take action about my fears. So, you know, when I was afraid of going into a shopping centre, go into the shopping centre. Sit down in the shopping centre for hours at a time deal with the fear of it. Does that make sense? Like, allow that to occur. Yep. When I do that, I'm going to change. As you see, if I have a real desire to change that I let grow inside of myself, the joy from the experience is just going to motivate me all the time. I'm going to, like, often myself and Mary have these conversations where Mary says, wow, I just love this divine love path. And I ask her, why is that, darling? And she said, I have changed so much and I can feel the changes as they're happening. Like, and isn't that wonderful? Like, just to be able to ha experience the joy. And you know when you change and you know how to change and you know what to do and you do change, you also start gathering within yourself a sense of 
like, it's not really pride, it's really a sense of being, a sense of knowing that everything is going to be right at some point. And you start actually trusting yourself more. You see, you see, a lot of times we try to change in our life, don't we? And it's a matter of learning, 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 and we still don't do it right. You, have you found that in the past? Like, you know, when, whenever you've done the uh, wanting to be peaceful thing. And so you go along and, and you meditate every day for an hour a day to be peaceful. Now, what happens the day that you can't get to meditate? Oh, no longer peaceful anymore, right? And, you know, everything starts, everything starts happening where I'm no longer able to be peaceful anymore. Why? Because the actual emotion, whatever it is that causes me to not be peaceful, is still within me. And all I've done over that meditation period is tried to get away from it for an hour a day, right? And that's got me into this place. So we don't want to do that anymore. What we want to do is do real change, really positive change where... I make the change and I don't have to think about it again. Right. So I remember when I was a kid and I was about uh, probably seven years of age, six years of age, and um, my, so seven years of age and my, my mother just became a Jehovah's Witness. Right. And the Jehovah's Witnesses have this thing and back then, every Thursday night it was where we lived, where, where you enrolled on a school... And what it was was a school where everybody who was a witness had, uh, was sort of expected to get up and talk for five minutes on a Bible subject. Right? And it was open to any person of any age. That's a wonderful thing, I think. Don't you think? It was great growing up with it anyway. And so what would happen is that in our little congregation, I suppose you'd call it, there was about 20 or 30 people. So what that meant was... There were like five talks every week. So in 20 or 30 people, that meant once a month, you got to go up and give your talk about a different subject. Right? And I remember the very first time I had to go up and give a talk. I can even remember what happened afterwards. Um, I remember this man brought me a redback spider, of all things, and then he squished it in his fingers. I don't know why he did that, but anyway, that, that was after my talk. But the... It was so, <laughs> and what, he, he just was proving to me that you know, I didn't need to be afraid of spiders, which didn't help my fear of spiders. <laughs> anyway, but, um, but the talk was some Bible subject. And, uh, <clears throat> and the beauty of what it did was it allowed me to work through my fear of getting up in front of a group of people at seven years of age. And I was the only seven-year-old in the audience. Obviously, it was quite unique. And then, and then what happened was um, it also allowed me to connect to my passion. And my passion, ever since I can remember, was to talk about God. Right? So it did two things at the same time. It helped me deal with a group of fears regarding public speaking, but also it helped me deal with, like, enjoy my passion. Now, of course, as I grew up a bit older, as I explained to Mary a few days ago, not a lot of people liked me being good at nine years of age, being able to give up a talk in front of a group of people. And so they then called me arrogant. So that, of course, did what? Started shutting me down. And I started becoming worried about, instead of being in this childlike area of passion when I would get up and speak, now I started feeling the cond condemnation and judgment. And in fact, there was a time when I was about nine years of age where I was invited to give a talk in front of 500 people. Right? And I had it all prepared and I did it all and we had to actually run through a rehearsal with uh, a person who approved of the talk before it was given. So it's quite controlling. And, uh, and so anyway, I run through my rehearsal and the man who was responsible for it told me that he wouldn't let me get up and give the talk. The reason why is because I was so up myself and I was only nine years of age. That's what he said. He got my parents and uh, brought my parents there as well and told them that he was quite disgusted with me and so forth. Pretty negative childhood event. Right? So, of course, those emotions then enter you. Does that make sense? And they, as they enter you, they then define what you then decide. 
So it got to the stage when I was a little older where I became very afraid of getting in front of a group of people and very afraid of the projections that I'd get if I was passionate. So what I did was I started, or I still loved getting, you know, to talk about God. So, so I have this conundrum now. My desire starts getting modified to suit the fears that I have. This happens to all of us, right? My desire gets modified to suit the fears. So the fears are, I'm afraid of the judgment and condescension emotions that are being aimed at me and being told that I'm arrogant and all those kind of things. So what I do is I now modify the presentation to suit what is getting projected at me so I don't get the same projections. Does that make sense? And you do this a lot of your life if you think about it, where you modify your desire to suit the projection coming at you so that you can avoid the projection. So what I'm recommending to you is to not do that anymore. Allow the projection to hit you and feel your emotion about it. Now, ironically, up until the age I was 33 years of age, so from the age of 7 to 33, by the time I was 33, I would get up in front of groups of audiences three times a week and the audience was always a minimum of 120 people. Right? Sometimes I would give an hour's talk in that time of, that would be in front of people. But, you know, in front of every one of those talks, generally, I had lots of fear. And I would get uh, to the state where I'd be shaking and quite, uh, it would be quite difficult for me. Four times a year I used to get up in front of 500 people, right? And one time a year in front of 5,000 people, right? Now, can you imagine what it was like getting in front of 5,000 people with those fears? I would, I would go into spasms all through my neck and my head. I would often need a massage the night before and I'd go, <laughs> all these different things would be happening just to, for me to get emotionally through the fear that I had about the presentation. Once I started dealing with the emotions of judgment and condescension and all those emotions, which by the way I did away from you know, those events, now when I get in, up in front of you, it doesn't feel like anything. It feels like just you and me having a conversation. Like, I don't think about it. I don't even think about what we're going to speak about anymore. Like, so, so this morning, like Mary's been saying the last three or four days, what are you going to talk about this weekend? I don't know. Nothing come to me, right? <laughs> and uh, and I, I didn't know what I was going to talk about at all. And this happens most weekends now. Like I don't know what I'm going to talk about. There's a long list of subjects I'd like to talk about, but not all of them feel right at the time, you know what I mean? And, and I don't know what to say about them anyway. So, so what happens is... <laughs> I don't. It's true. And so, so what happens is I go, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. And this, this week, myself and Mary, Mary's been in heaps of emotions this week and it's been very emotional at home and I've been in quite a few emotions this week, very emotional. And, like, who wants to worry about what I've got to talk about on Saturday? <laughs> like, honestly, we've got more important things to worry about. And, and so what happens is I come to a place like this and Ken was the first person to ask me this morning, what are you going to talk about, AJ? And what was my answer? I got no idea, Ken, sorry. <laughs> I can't even put it on the net anymore. Like I don't, to be honest, I don't even know what I've put on the net anymore. So if you read what's on the net about what I'm going to speak about, please understand you're probably going to get disappointed uh, because I've got no idea. But what happens is in, this mo in a moment things happen. And when you're connected a little bit more, things happen and you start to just, it just flows out of you. Why? because you've dealt with the fear that prevents that flow. Right? So it's the same with positive change. If I desire the change and I deal with the fear that prevents the change, then the change is going to happen in a joyous manner. But if I, just get, if I focus on dealing with all of these things without the desire, it's going to be very difficult for me to have any joy. And you know what's happening for many of you? You're not feeling joy, hey? So can you see on one side of things, you're jo you feel joy about all the things you're receiving, like the external truths, if you like, many of you are just wrapped with, aren't you? 
Like you just feel like, wow, that's the truth, I feel that. Wow, that's the truth, I feel that. And many of you have expressed that to us. But when you actually get into dealing with the emotions, it starts feeling all bogged down and hard and sad and grief all the time. And, right? and the reason why it is, is because often what we are doing is when we're not passionately desiring positive change, what we're actually doing is we're dealing with these things all the time and we're scared of dealing with those things all the time. We're afraid of dealing with those things all the time. Rather than just thinking, oh, but this is part of the process. This is a part of a joyous process of my soul opening. And what happens is that we finish up not acting in harmony with our childlike desires because we're afraid of what's going to happen as a result of me expressing my childlike desires. So what we want to do over the next few months to challenge you with this is we're going to start using these sessions as a forum for you to start dealing with some emotions. All right? And that means there might be some singing involved <laughs> in front of a group and there might mean be some you know, talking in front of the group and so forth. Does that make sense? that you have the opportunity to start addressing some of these fears. So what we were thinking of doing is instead of having a weekend where AJ, AJ just babbles on for the whole weekend, what we do instead of that is we have a Saturday talk or something like that and then a Sunday session is about actually dealing with some of the emotions in a public setting. How does that sound to you? Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah. That's, that's good. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> when I say, who wants to come up and sing and nobody puts their hand up, we go, what, what, what happened? We know a partner wants to come up and sing, but who else wants to? If we have a mic, just too big. <clears throat> so AJ, if I'm hearing you right, if I'm understanding what you're saying, mm -hmm. If we are passionately desiring positive change, that will enable us to drop into the emotions a lot faster rather than just, you know, what I noticed initially that I was doing would be simmering in emotions and, and I would feel horrible for... Um, for days. Up to, yeah, days, maybe a week, and yeah. then, bam, I would get into it and yeah. I'm finding I'm getting a little bit better at getting into it quicker now. Yeah. But So that's that passionately desiring positive change and that gets us quicker into it. Totally. Um, let's look at why. You're actually, during the, let's say, the six days before the day, so you've got a one day period where you deal with the emotion. Okay? The six days before then, you're actually in this place where you're doing what is opposite to God's laws. right? So you're actually in a place of resisting, stagnating. Right? Now, any stagnation has pain associated with it. So for that entire period, I'm going to be in a place of pain. Does that make sense? Automatically going to be in a place of pain. If I, Mary's going to show you in her courses, I, I won't talk much about them. So. Um, <laughs> but she's going to show you how to, how to get into some of the blockage, blocking emotions, right? Instead of me focusing on getting to that emotion, all I do is I go, all right, I'm not getting to that emotion. I must have a block. So all I do is pray about, uh, to God about the block and then go out and do some gardening. What's the point in doing anything else? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, if I'm not in it, then there's a reason why I'm not in it. Now, now, of course, there are times when you feel quite down on yourself about not getting into things and you need to feel those emotions. Yesterday I felt that myself, where I was going through not getting into this emotion that I'm in now and I felt quite frustrated, as Mary will attest to. I was quite, quite frustrated all day, like until about four or five o'clock at night. And then I started to express some of the frustration and then I got down into some of the grief about the frustration which connected me to some of the emotion. But, but the key is to allow yourself to get into the state where you're not in a simmering state, but rather either feeling the emotion or doing something else. Right? Allow yourself to do something that makes your life joyful. You see, if, if you live in your desire most of the time, what will happen is the things that need to be triggered will automatically get triggered anyway. Right? So, for example... If you're passionate about speaking about the divine truth to others, right, the thing that's going to trigger a lot of your emotions about 
why you don't do it is going ahead and speaking about the divine truth to somebody. Does that make sense? And all of a sudden, the emotions will come up in the situation. So allow yourself to go into the situation. You see, a lot of the times what we do is we know what the emotion is at the end, but we don't allow ourselves to actually go into a situation today that would actually help us access that emotion either. You see, if I was passionately desiring change, what would I choose to do? I go, all right, okay. I know that I'm afraid of uh, sexual projection from men and I feel ashamed as a result of them. Let's say that's my emotion. Um, every time I go out walking along the Malula Bar Esplanade or you might pick another place down at Sunshine Coast, here at the Sunshine Coast, what do they call it? The shopping centre? Whatever that is. What's it called? Plaza, Plaza sorry. So, so every time I go down there and I finish up getting sexual projections from men and I hate it. Well, we hate it because we're in these emotions. Let's flip that over for a moment. All right, do I want to deal with this emotion? Do I have a passionate desire to get rid of my sexual shame so I don't have sexual shame anymore? Do I? Yes. All right, put on a skimpy top, skimpy shorts or whatever, <laughs> and go down there and walk past and get the sexual projections and feel your emotion. Why wouldn't you do that? You could do that, couldn't you? You could choose to do that. But we don't, do we? What we do, instead of doing that, is we go home we don't want to go to the shopping centre because that we'll get the projections there. So we go home and we sit there for five, six days thinking, how can I get into this emotion? I don't know how to get into this emotion. I'm feeling all this fear about the emotion, right? And I'm not getting into the emotion when I could actually just take one action that's harmonious with having a passionate desire to change and all of a sudden the emotion would be triggered. Does that make sense? Like, we can do that all the time, can't we? Yeah, so... So uh, oftentimes what happens for us is that we live in the fear that is shutting down the emotion rather than actually feeling the emotion. And that is a painful process. In fact, I would call that what you called it, I think, wasn't it? Agony, really? That's what it feels like. Agony feels like staying stuck for days and days and days on end because I don't deal with an emotion. And I could easily trigger it. Like, let's say, um, all right, I'm a uh, male, let's say, and all my life I've, I've looked at pornography on the sly. Right? In other words, I've you know, made sure no one's around me and then I get on the internet and check out, you know, <laughs> do, do that, whatever, and, and maybe masturbate or whatever I do along with it. And that's what I do. That's, that's, but I don't deal with the emotion. What's driving me to do that? Right? So I go into the shop and, you know, and I look around and make sure... And I know I can buy it off of someone without them making me feel bad. So, you know, I get a bit of the porn and off I go and buy it from that person, but that's the only person I'll get it from. What I'm doing is actually... Or, or even better than that, I might... Uh, just, sorry, I, I go onto this side tracks all the time <laughs> lately. Um, I might even go into, like, a sex shop or something like that where it's going to be acceptable for me to buy the porn, right? And then still do it on the slide, right? Okay, so... So what would be better instead of that? Grabbing the wife, walking down <laughs> to, the, to the local paper shop, you know, picking up the porn magazine that you really want, going to the desk, buying it over the counter, right, and feel all of those projections you're getting from your wife, <laughs> from the person over the counter, right? <laughs> And then, and then, take, this is going to be, sound really confronting, take that home and do what you normally do <laughs> in front of the wife <laughs> to deal with this emotion. Do you think the emotion is going to come up then? <laughs> I, would say, I would say it probably will. And you might think I'm joking, but I'm actually serious. <laughs> huh? You see, what we often do in our day-to-day -day life is we live in this place of fear of change. Or, um, and really what that is, is we want to stay stagnant, right? And so, so instead of desiring change and then acting harmonious with the desire that's within us to change, we are so afraid of everything. We're so afraid to do whatever we need to do to change. So, so in my own progression, I've had to confront lots of different issues like that 
there was no other way I could confront them. You know, no other way I could confront them. How do I confront the fear of what you're going to say and do when I tell you I'm Jesus? Like, no, seriously, I considered staying home, trying to progress until I was at one with God before I would say to anybody who I am. Right? And I did think about that for quite some time, quite a few years actually, right? where, where I was so afraid to say anything to anyone because I knew there'd be projections, right? So, so what I did instead was I just stayed home and said, so how do I deal with this? How do I deal with this? I don't know how to deal with this. You know, there's fears there all the time. It's all there all the time. And then I realised I was doing the wrong thing. What I needed to do was get out there in front of a group of people, say it, and just let myself get hammered by the projections and let myself feel the emotion. Now, one of the places I did that first was at Florida and I, there was a group of uh, about 100 or so people in the audience and I was talking about the divine truth to them. You know, the, I was doing the introduction to the universe, the secrets of the universe type introduction that many of you have seen. And, uh, and the first time, the fir one of the first, what I used to do uh, before, I, I wouldn't say who I was at all, the entire discussion. Right? But sooner or later, every single time, somebody would say, how do you know this is true? <laughs> Guaranteed. Like, and so because I'm the group and I want to stay in honesty and integrity and keep my connection with God, I would then have to say, you know, oh, well, actually, I've experienced it all. And they say, well, how come that is the case? And, I, and then who were you then in the first... Like, it was a convoluted series of questions. Ange has been there where, 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 you know, someone had to ask me a whole chain of questions before I would actually admit to them that I'm actually Jesus. Does that make sense? And why did all that happen? Because I was totally avoiding and I was living in the fear of it rather than living in, the desire, in my desire. My desire was to teach, be up front. Right? So when I'm up front, half the audience leaves sometimes, but that's okay. The other half might stay and listen. So what happened at one time in Florida is I get a group of people, half of them are new age people, and the other half go to a Christian church. <laughs> so imagine, imagine this uh, as an audience. So, um, so I say who I am and like instantly 30 people stand up, project rage at me and walk out the door. And I'm going, well, you know, that's pretty, like, mm, blah, 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 what do I say now? Like, <laughs> and then the other 60 or 70 basically just hammered me with all the reasons why they believed that couldn't be true. Right. So I had to work through. I had to work through all this judgment, condescension, all these beliefs about Jesus that people have that are all obviously very inaccurate, and all of these other things that just hammered me, hammered me, hammered me through the presentation. Now I would never have dealt with the majority of those emotions without that event, but I had to create the event because I could have sat at home and somehow got to at one minute with God in 30 or 50 years' time, maybe before I died, you know, and then dealt with the issue. Like, well, obviously I would have dealt with it through that period, but it's almost impossible, isn't it? And it's not the fastest thing to do. The fastest thing to do is confront the emotion. So how many of you ladies are actually scared of ever having a relationship with a man that's open and vulnerable? Yeah, where you're open and vulnerable. You're scared, right. What you need to do is create one. Not a man. <laughs> create the relationship where you are open and vulnerable. So any man that's in your life right now, what you do is you start being open and vulnerable. Does that make sense? You don't, don't wait to make him. You don't, see, many of you are waiting for a man who's nice. Who will listen to it? Who will listen to everything? And who wants to hear you? Trust me, that's not going to make you open and vulnerable. All that's doing is pandering to your fear or your addiction of, of maintaining your fear. You see. So what you need to do is right. Choose the man who you find the hardest to be emotionally open and vulnerable. 
and go and be emotionally and open and vulnerable to him. If he's in your life, I mean, you know. There's a law of attraction going on, right? If he's in your life, be open and vulnerable to him. And then let yourself own the emotion that goes on there. See, see, when I passionately desire change, I will passionately desire confronting situations to open myself up more emotionally. Right? Can you see that? Yeah. And if I allow myself to work my way through the fears that I have by doing the desirous thing, like acting in desire, what will happen is my changes will be rapid, but also they'll be more joyous because, you know, I haven't had, had, haven't had to have the law of attraction pummel me for a year before I dealt with something, right? I actually volunteered to deal with it and now I have a sense of pride, a sense of ownership in that process. I'm volunteering to deal with this. This is good. I know I want to deal with this. I'm volunteering to deal with this. I am going to stay in my desire to deal with this and because I put myself in the desire to deal with it and I'm volunteering to deal with it, it feels a lot better already, doesn't it not? Rather than getting hammered, hammered, hammered again, hammered again by law of attraction going, oh, I hate this, I hate this emotion, I hate this, isn't this terrible? And we're raving on to ourselves and anybody who will listen to how terrible my law of attraction is and so forth. And in reality, of course it's going to be pain and agony during that place because I'm totally in opposition to God's laws in that moment because God's laws are going to demand eventually change of me. Right? That's what they do. Can we go to Louise and then across to... <sighs> Monique. Monique. AJ, I've got a fear of skydiving and deep sea diving. Does that mean I have to confront, confront those physical fears as well? Is there an emotion behind my fear of There's those always things? an emotion between, behind every fear. So, so my suggestion, if you're confronting the one of skydiving, um, my suggestion would be maybe uh, go to a place like uh, Queenstown in New Zealand where they have lots of people where you can do bungee jumping, right? And just, just stand on the edge and let them tie a rope around your leg and jump off. <laughs> and let yourself fear what comes up. He's serious. Yeah, I'm serious. Doing isn't yeah. I mean bungee jumping is dangerous, I've understood. It's not as dangerous as skydiving. And a rope's attached to you where there's only two shoots with it. <laughs> you can deal with the fear by doing a safer thing, is what I'm trying safer to indicate. Okay. Yeah. So there is an emotion in me that's creating my fear of those. Yeah. Weapons. So if I if I'm scared of deep sea stuff, yeah. I would firstly maybe enrol myself in a scuba diving pool thing. But tell him, I only want to do it in a pool. Yeah. So yeah that, I feel a bit better about the, the so pool you do thing. So you do the yeah. pool thing and then you say, all right, now I want to do it in the sea. Right? And you do it in the sea thing and confront the fear. Yeah. Like my neighbours took me up in a, an ultralight. Um, yeah, that'll do it. And I was telling um, Jackie, the wife who had a stroke and couldn't speak, that tell Ron not to take me up more than... 100 feet because I'm 100 meters because I'm absolutely petrified. Anyway, she never got the message across because she couldn't speak properly. Yeah. <laughs> Your law of attraction, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he took me up way beyond the clouds, and I was so petrified that I just my muscles tightened, and I I didn't overcome any fear at all. I was too in fear, you know. General general thing with fear. Breathe. Yeah. So, as soon as you stop breathing, you are controlling your fear rather than expressing it. Now, an ultralight may not be that a safe place to start expressing your fear. Well, especially Ron was saying, oh, you know, this is in Victoria, oh, that's where Jackie skydived and had a stroke while she was skydiving. And he's telling me this stuff with absolutely no fear while I'm just, you know, very kind of fearful things he was talking about. Yeah, so yeah. that didn't help me. Yeah, so there are things you can do that are safer mm -hmm that can yeah. help you trigger your fear. So what happens every time you get in a jet? Do you get a window seat or an aisle seat? Um, I, ha I don't have a fear in a plane. I'm all right. Okay. Yeah. No so I, I don't so a lighter plane, yeah. like a, a one-engine plane? I, yeah, I'd be a bit more fearful. I'd sit in the middle where I couldn't so, see. So how many others of you are afraid of, say, like if you're afraid of going in a one-engine plane? How many others of you? There's four. There's enough of you to hire a plane. <laughs> <laughs> For an hour. There is. Hire a plane for an hour, 
and you tell the pilot, we're all here to deal with our... <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you. I hope I don't have to do the bungee jump or try and deal with my fear before that. But does that make sense? Like, like yeah. confront your fear. Yeah. Like, if you have a passionate desire to deal with your fear, rather than living in it, you will... Oh, okay. I was hoping to avoid those couple of things. I know, and that's the point, you see. <laughs> you, see you see, remember what I said about our fear? Yeah. Our fear causes us to try to do everything we can to avoid it. So if I'm afraid of worth change events and I'm afraid of discomfort, what am I going to create? I'm going to create somewhere where in, inland a bit that's a nice place that's got all the comfortable mod cons with solar water heating and solar, you know, everything. And I'm going to cre create all of that. But what am I actually doing? Creating everything out of my fear. And I'm not dealing with my fear. Uh, that's not confronting your fear. That, that is actually living in your fear. Mm. Living in your fear doesn't release anything. Confronting your fear would be, yes, the four or five or six of you ladies who had the fear of this little plane, get in this little tin can plane, <laughs> right? And, and have to look out the window <laughs> and let him fly as high as he wants. Or a helicopter. Be or a, a helicopter. Yeah. And <laughs> when we were in New Zealand, we went in a helicopter. And uh, we, we went over the uh, Mount Cook, like the, you know, that region that's no region it was spectacular i loved it it was like the helicopter was interesting because it was like a bubble and you were sitting over the bubble so you could see everything right and so he'd, he'd fly you purposely around the cliffs and then you'd go so you'd be going up a cliff up a cliff and then you, as you go over there's a thousand foot drop straight away right and mary goes <laughs> 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 and made, like just a little bit of a great. but after we got off mary goes hell that was so much fun like <laughs> <laughs> Can we do that again? You know, like, <laughs> and, and so you start to deal with a lot of your stuff. And the key is to breathe. You must breathe if you want to deal with your fear. You must breathe. Breathing is a part of the release process. As soon as you lock that, you know how the fear causes you to go <gasps> and, and lock everything up, lock up all your breath. Now you're not dealing with your fear at all. Now you're just living in it now. So that's not, that's not the point of it. The point is to stay breathing, stay breathing, stay breathing. Let yourself experience this as stay breathing, whatever it is you're afraid of. I'm afraid the prop's going to stop. So, you know, feel that fear. I'm afraid that we might crash. I'm afraid the back tail thing might fly off and we go around like that or whatever. You know, let yourself feel those fears and, and stay in the moment by breathing through them. You see, you can create every positive situation you need to change but it's going to need some bravery. And this is what I wanted to do. In the next half of the session, I wanted to talk about two primary qualities, faith and courage. Those are the two qualities I want to discuss with you next because, because without faith and courage, you will all eventually revert to this place of staying in the fear, anger, or whatever, rather than actually going in the desire to actually deal with the issue. And to treat it as a like a, an experiment that can create joy for you. So if I clear the fear, I don't have to bungee jump and skydive? <laughs> <laughs> if you cleared the fear, you would never even ask that question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> because what would happen if I'd clear, dealt with the fear mm. is I would actually go, oh, opportunity to bungee jump. Sounds all right. <laughs> you know, like you'd go. Mm. When we were in Queenstown, I wanted to go and... Uh, and do some bungee jumping. And there's, there's another one you can do that's quite very safe. And that is there's these giant swings. Have you seen those? They're sort of like bungee jumping a bit, but you're attached to a harness onto a sort of like, I'll draw a bit for you. This is an aside that helps you deal with some of these fears. It's like a great big rope like that with a swing attached and they put you on a harness and they draw you up like that. And you, and you free fall and then you go, and then you free fall and then you go, so it's not something happens once, you know what I mean? And then you free fall and then you go like... And then in the end you're left just hanging there and then they wind you back up again because the actual place where you get on is up here. Now, do you think after that you would have dealt with some fear of heights and fear of... <laughs> Definitely. And it's very safe. Oh, OK. Where do you do that? Well, I don't know. is there a place here at Surface Paradise? Uh, what... 
Yet there's also a place I notice at Service Paradise where they have those trampolines and they strap the, the bungees, cords to you, and they jack you up and you can go down and bounce on the trampoline. Now that's where to start, right? Like you might only get a 10 or 12 foot high or you know, three or four meter high one of those and give that a go. Like, like attach yourself to one of these things and bounce up and down and get the feel of oh, the height, you know, and the fear and all that starts coming up. And, you know, you might graduate to this in the long run. But allow yourself to make positive steps. You see, most of the time what we're doing is we're going, change, change, no, change. I don't want to change. I don't want to change. I'm too scared. I'm too scared to deal with this fear, right? I'm too scared to deal with the fear. I'm, I'm, a, I'm afraid of the fear itself in reality. And the reality is I'm not passionately desiring change in that moment. What I'm passionately desiring to do is keep my fear to myself. I want to nurse my fear. I want to love it. You know, make love to my fear. It's beautiful. And that's not the way we feel, is it? But in the end, what finishes up happening is we create a life that is just loving our fear, that, that embraces our fear and keeps it to ourselves all the time. And that's no way to live your life. Yeah, no way to live. So let yourself do things like that, challenging things. Many of them nowadays are quite safe, right? <laughs> No, many of them now are very safe. <laughs> but you won't feel safe doing them. See, lo logically, if you've got a thing, a rope attached to you that's a steel cable, logically, you know, it's pretty hard to break it. Something very unusual has to happen, right? So logically, you know you're very safe. You're probably safer than you are walking across the road, right? And, uh, and certainly safer than you would be flying, for example, in a jet. And yet a lot of the times we're so afraid of what's before us and th that's the whole thing. We need to deal with this fear so that we're not that afraid. Like, how are you going to go when you start flying? I mean, like, like levitating. <laughs> <laughs> You'll only levitate two metres. <laughs> Why? Like, Why? Like, honestly, uh, well, when, we were over in, when we were over in New Zealand, there's this lovely Mount Cook region, you know, some of you may have been there, and it's just so beautiful and pristine, but it's so steep, you know, and like we went on a bushwalk, myself and Mary, and it took us six hours. Like we, we did 13 kilometres or something bushwalk, but it took us six hours to get up to the side of the glacier when I could have just levitated myself up there in five minutes. Like, <laughs> why would you do the six hour walk when you could do that? Exercise. Yeah, fear is the only reason why. And, and so, so, like, so if I deal with my fears, I'm going to be able to enjoy those kind of things to, in the future. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, it's, it's such a big fear that I'm laughing, but I won't be laughing when I'm on that thing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and, the, and just say to the people, look, I, to be honest with you, this is all about feeling some of my fear. So if I come back in a catonic state, you'll be able to help me, won't you? Like <laughs> look, I've been abseiling with my aerobics teacher and she, because I, I was the person who's had the most fear in all her groups, she talks to groups about me. Because I did overcome my fear and go down and even went a bit of a high, on a higher cliff. But, yeah. yeah, for some reason, it's been such a big fear. I don't yeah. know why. But it, and it's much harder dealing with your fear of heights and doing, say, rock climbing or something like that. And that's obviously a lot more dangerous than it is mm -hmm. to do something that you're very... that somebody can strap you back yeah. up in. Um, whereas if you do something like rock climbing, you could freeze up and then what do they do? Like, mm. it's very, very difficult. Yeah. Whereas if somebody does freeze up, you know, on one of these bungee things, you just say to them, look, if I freeze up, you just stop and let me deal with it, won't you? Like, let me have a cry or whatever. D tell them up front, mm. you know. Yeah, and if there's a group true. of you who will have the same, mm. you just all go along and say, we're all here to deal with our fear about heights. <laughs> we need to cry about it when we get into the shaking place. You'll let us do that, won't you? And, and you just an extra 10 bucks for doing that, right? <laughs> and I'm pretty sure they would. And if, if not, an extra 20 might do it. But, um, <laughs> yeah, the abseiling guy was good when I was crying as I was about to go over the cliff and clenching onto his arm and not letting go. He, he was quite patient with me. Yeah. But, and then yeah. I did go over the cliff. Yeah. And the key is then allow yourself to deal with the emotion of it like that. And let, but breathe, really let yourself breathe. Don't don't lock yourself up in the terrified state. Breathe, breathe your way through the state. Yeah. Now, it's three o'clock, I think, isn't it? Um, can you remember your questions for later, if you can? What we'll do is we'll stop now, and when we come back, I'll answer a few more questions about things like that, 
and I know many of you have a few suggestions, so we'll take those. And then what we'll do is we'll deal with the two issues of courage and faith and how that affects you having a passionate, having a passionate desire to, to grow.